thank God for Steve and Gail Ferris. Steve Ferris is the chair of our stewardship ministry leadership team, and he celebrates his 80th birthday this week. And so uh, when we talk about what we're talking about today and being intergenerational, uh, one of the reasons to press in, if you're younger specifically, is to walk with people and hear people uh, like Steve speak into your life. And the reason that the New Hope for the Future team exists uh, is not because we're like hurting for money. In fact, two weeks ago, we had the largest undesignated offering in the history of our church. And so we praise God uh, for that. But we want to be good stewards. We want to be faithful stewards when God entrusts us to, to, to build his kingdom, to be a part of what he's doing. And we want all of our members to experience what it means to be a part of what God is doing and to experience uh, really putting him first in, in all areas of our life, including giving. As I shared uh, earlier, uh, we had a big crowd last Sunday in the service. We do as well today. And uh, we are approaching close to a thousand people engaged with us on Sundays. And so uh, a couple things to share. One is I realize, well, we j- first is we just got to figure some things out. So uh, hey, let's just keep loving Jesus and, and be flexible. Uh, but um, secondly is, if you don't have a student, uh, so like if you don't have to be at the 930 service worshiping um, because your student is in life group at 11 o'clock, and so we want you to be here if that's you, but, uh, or if your life group isn't meeting at 11, so you can go to the 8 o'clock traditional service, or you can go to the 11 o'clock service, Uh, We'd love for you to do that. The 11 o'clock service actually growing a little bit as well. And so uh, you would help that too. So uh, we'd love for you to come uh, to one of those services instead. And then also there are a lot of needs for serving. Uh, We just put out on uh, social media this week that we're looking for people to serve in the worship team, whether that be the choir or as musicians or uh, helping with our uh, tech team. And so uh, reach out to Justin, um, the connect team, which greets people and helps people find their way and figure out uh, how to take the next step. We we love people to serve in those capacities. Of course, with the growing children's ministry, there's always a need for those uh, to, to serve in, alongside our children as well. So those are just some ways you can get involved. And uh, again, if you're new here, uh, we took a six-week break or are taking a six-week break from going through the Gospel of Mark, and we're looking at um, a series we've called uh, Through All Generations, How We Are Better Together. And we're talking about God's design for uh, generations to really do church uh, together. Now, I want to explain why we're doing this. The reason that we are doing this is because it is just very evident in the scriptures, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that it is important to God. See, that's the reason we try to do anything we do as a church is because it's important to God. I wanna make a distinction here because it can be easy when you know numbers are good for a church to think, okay, they're doing things and they're working and that's why they do them. But numbers only start a conversation, they don't end a conversation. Uh, uh, not too long ago, a pastor friend of mine was explaining that his church was in a period of decline And they were plateaued. And he said that he needed to focus his church on discipleship. And he said, because I was at this conference and they told us, right now, if you want your church to grow, you need to be focused on discipleship. And then he kind of complimented us and said, you know, and you guys have got that. And so that's what we need to do. Listen, we do not focus on things because they will lead to growth. We focus on things because God says to focus on things. So the emphasis that we have as a church and whatever it might be should be because it matters to God, because it's God's heart. And so the reason we focus on discipleship is because that's what Jesus has commanded us to do. And the reason we're focusing in for six weeks on intergenerational discipleship is because we see a gap between how this church and the church in America functions and how God's people are designed and what God's heart is for his people. And a very clear text that talks about this is Deuteronomy chapter six. That's where we were last week. That's where we will be this morning as well. You can turn there if you have uh, your Bibles or open the app up and get on there as well. Don't be distracted by Facebook or Instagram. And uh, what we're going to see today is something that I think matters to us as parents and us as the Christian community, as the church. And I wanna talk about three things we need to be if we want to ensure we reach the next generation. Three things we need to be if we want to ensure we reach the next generation in our homes and as a faith community. The first thing is to be intentional. 
to be intentional. I said that I would unpack this more today, and we need to be sure that we do not overlook this, even though what we looked at in Deuteronomy 6 hit on this last week. If I were to diagnose the problem with the church remaining effective in our culture, I would not say that the problem is the culture. If I were to say why the church struggles to remain effective, not just this church, the church at large, in our culture, I would not say that the problem is our culture. Yes, there are all kinds of problems in our culture. But the Bible and history are full of the church facing cultural problems. The reason that the church is often ineffective is because we are not continuing to do the things we are told to do or making the corrections that are necessary regardless of where the culture is. The reason that I think we get this wrong is because we're using the diagnostic wrong. You see, the Bible prescribes for us how we are to live our lives as the people of God. It does not tell the culture how it should be. Does the Bible speak to issues in our culture? Absolutely. But the Bible's design is for the people of God with the, empowered by the Spirit of God to obey God. And what I would say often exists in the church, and this church too, is it's like we're taking the stethoscope, right? Like we have shortness of breath and we don't feel great. And so we take a stethoscope and we put it to other people. And we're like, oh, here's their regular heartbeat with them. Or here's the thing that's going on with them. That's why I don't feel good. That's why I'm not where I should be. When it's intended to be put on our chest to tell us about ourselves so that we know what we should do in response to how we're doing and feeling. And I think a lot of times the church is busy pointing the finger at all the problems in the culture instead of looking to the word of God and doing what God has told us to do and examining ourselves. The problem that the church has with remaining effective is largely because of passivity among Christians, which is almost always something that goes along with the church or the people of God when there is a time of prosperity. This is a problem that reoccurred in the Bible and this is what God is saying through Moses in Deuteronomy 6 as the people prepare to enter the promised land. He's saying, you saw how quickly you turned to a golden calf when you were waiting to hear from God in the wilderness. Well, you will quickly turn to godless idolatry if you aren't intentional. And your children will turn to that if you don't teach them the greatness of God and what he has done for you. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, he's saying the commandments of God matter. And then he says this in verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And I'm going to stop there. Because here we already see three aspects of being intentional. The first is to teach diligently. Diligently. The phrasing used here, teach them diligently, is from the idea of sharpening a tool. It's the same term that is used in Deuteronomy chapter 32, the same book, to explain sharpening a sword. Now when you hear this phrase, you might think of right-wing groups like the Quiverful Movement who've twisted scripture in a cultural war. But just because there are groups that twist scripture and abuse power does not mean there aren't principles in the scriptures that they're abusing that aren't applicable. And so we need to realize that there is an idea in the Bible of God's people multiplying their families through childbirth and through other methods to increase the gospel. Now, I realize as I say that, that there are people who struggle with infertility. There are people who end up, you know, going through divorce. And so there's a lot of nuances to that. And I'm not, this is not a legalistic approach to this. But as the people of God, by and large, we should want to grow our families and have more and more people who follow Jesus. And the Bible uses this imagery of the weapon. Again, don't take me out of context this morning. But here, here's what I think that the scripture is saying. 
We think of our children and we need to think of a target for them. We need to aim them in a direction. And if we don't have an aim for their life, if we don't have a target for their life, and again, ultimately they make decisions when they become uh, adults and before that, but you know, we, if we don't have that, someone else will. If you don't take responsibility for a direction, an aim, a target for your children's life, someone else will. People are not amoral. People are not neutral. Not a person who has ever existed is. And when we think about businesses and government and, and we think about nonprofits, people are behind them. And if you don't think that their morals and their viewpoint are driving these organizations, you are deceived. And, and I like how Tim Keller says, even the idea that private belief should not be public is a public belief. You have to say that publicly, that you believe nobody should talk private, uh, publicly about what they believe. Well, that's what you believe. Anyway, you get it. And so people are not neutral. And it has always been this way, but perhaps it's more obvious now because of the internet, because of social media. If you aren't trying to teach your children truth, if we aren't trying to teach the children of the next generation truth, others will teach their truth to them. It's true. The, the phrase indoctrination gets a bad rap because it's used wrongly. But actually, at the heart of the church was the desire to indoctrinate our children with core truths of who God is so that they would transcend whatever happens in their life. And if you're not trying to do that, someone else will do that. So what are some things we want our children to know this year? What are some things we want our children to know before they leave our home? And how are we getting across that across to them? These are questions we must answer. And as a church, we must ask, what are we trying to teach the children and the students who come on our campus? What are we trying to teach adults who come on our campus? Because it ain't just getting them here and keeping them here. It's an aim. It's a target for their life. You see, so this morning as I was thinking about this, I started drawing, and let me give you two disclaimers here before, the, you can go ahead and put up on the screen so that they can laugh when I say this. Penmanship is not my gift, okay? And I'm almost 40, I don't want you to teach me penmanship. I don't have the bandwidth to learn to be a better writer. I don't even do it that often. Um, if I had thought about this ahead of time, Justin would have come up with some cool graphic for me. So, um, but I was thinking about it, the, the target, right? Like for the Christian's life is discipleship, following Jesus. Listening to God, obeying God, however that looks in our life. So that's the goal, that's the target for our children's life. Let me give you one other disclaimer. You probably have to look at this screen because you can't read this screen. And just in case you are wondering, we know, and we ordered a new projector months ago, but everything's on back order. So eventually you'll be able to see the screen. I'm sorry for your neck man stiff if you have to look in a weird direction. Let's all look at this screen, okay? So, so here's what I think happens. In addition to the goal of being a disciple, that's the aim, we have other goals for our children. And, and you can go ahead and put that next uh, drawing that is even worse up. Go ahead. See, uh, success, I'm just gonna read it because you probably can't read it. Relationships, I think I left out an eye there. Uh, fun and being moral. Look, we're just gonna assume that all of us have good definitions of what success means relationship, have them being, having relationships, us having a relationship with them, fun means, moral means. We're just gonna assume that. Those are not bad things. But what I think happens to us is we, we forget where we're ultimately headed. You can go to the next slide. And we just focus on success for our children. Or we just focus on having a relationship with our children. Or we just focus on them being moral and whatever that looks like in our culture. Or them having fun in their life. And we forget all those things. The ultimate goal is being a disciple of Jesus. You can go to the next picture that I drew. You see, the arrows continue, it's just terrible. The arrows continue to go like, hey, I want you to be successful and use that as a disciple of Jesus. I want you to have fun and be a disciple of Jesus. I want you to have morals because it helps you understand the gospel. And, it, and, and really, you're responding to the gospel. And, and I wanna have a relationship with you, but ultimately, I want that to point us to be more like Jesus. And so this should be the goal. And, and I would say for the church as well, you can go to the next one, that the goal of what we do here is to make disciples of Jesus. And so church growth 
is growth for the sake of growth is cancerous. If it's not pointing to more followers of Jesus, it's not what it should be. And if we have friendships, but we're not pointing people to Jesus, they're not where they should be. And I would say even if we are doing missions, and it's ultimately not with the goal of people seeing and believing in the gospel and following Jesus, even our doing and missions efforts are falling short. We have to be diligent about what we're teaching. The second aspect of being intentional is to teach constantly. Teach constantly. The places that Moses mentions here are great to address. He says, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, what I would say today is when we're in the morning with our children, when we're in the car with our children, when we're at the dinner table, at bedtime, on our weekends, when we're gathered together as the church, when we're involved in our children's activities, if they have a phone, in texting, the vacations that we take, all of these things are, are opportunities for us to be teaching our children about who God is and how he can be trusted. And do not let entertainment and busyness and friends, those are all fine things. Don't let them eliminate you spending time teaching your children about who God is. You have, in their life, if, let's say zero to 18, you have 157,248 hours with them. Now, I think they sleep some of that, so you have about 100,000. And some of that, they're young and they don't really understand what you're saying, so it's even less. You have 18 summers with your children. You have 936 Sundays. You have 936 weekends. Some of you are thinking 525,600 minutes. Glad you got that out of your head. I'm trying to emphasize that you have just a limited amount of time where you have this kind of high proximity. I'm not saying the relationship ends. You have to constantly be teaching and talking about who Jesus is. And as a church, we have a limited amount of time with people on our campus. And we have to be so intentional about helping them see the truth of scripture and live their life. About 30, 40 years ago, a model was birthed called the seeker-sensitive model of church where really we started to say, hey, there are non-Christians you know, on our campus and so we need to be focused on them. And while I would say we need to be sensitive to that, and if you're here today, we, don't, we, we know that some of the stuff we do and say doesn't make sense, but we're, we're trying to do it and say it in a way that at least somewhat makes sense to you. But churches that just say, hey, we're just gonna keep everything light constantly for non Christians, I would just say, come as you are, and then what I've noticed is most people keep going to those churches for 10 years, and they never grow any deeper, and that is a problem. Life is too urgent and short for us to not be focusing on the word of God for people's lives. That's what people need is to hear from God, and so everything we're doing, we should be focusing in on that, and I would just say to you, if you're like, this feels like work to me, why does it feel like work to you? Does it feel like work to talk about Alabama football? Or Florida football? Because talking about Alabama football does feel like work to me. <laughs> does it feel like work to talk about your children? Or your job? Or your hobby? Or golf? Whatever it might be. I would say that if this feels like work to you, then maybe you don't realize the work Christ did for you on the cross and what it means to be his son and daughter because this is an overflow of who we are in Christ. We need to constantly be teaching. I, I wanna say one more thing about being intentional and I referenced this last week. It's this, it's not just what you teach, it's what you emphasize. It's not just what you teach, it's what you emphasize. Now there is debate on whether or not you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates, whether or not that was to be taken literally or figuratively. But it is clear that the Jewish people, for the most part, did take this literally. So phylacteries were these small boxes holding parchment with scriptures on them. 
that would be held to the forehead or on the hand with these leather straps um, as described in this text. The mezuzah was a small box containing parchment placed on doorpost. And Jesus would actually condemn the Pharisees the way they did this. They made them oversized so people noticed that they had them. So having these things is not a foolproof plan of spirituality and can even be dangerous with the wrong motivation. And like I talked about a few weeks ago, just because you have a sign in your house that says, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord, doesn't mean you're actually doing that. But at the same time, the truth is we want to use our homes and use our lives to have these intentional reminders of God's word. And we really need to think about what message are we sending to our children and the people that come into our homes. And I just think that in our day, a time of affluence, a time of prosperity, a time of cultural fads, we often as the church are just jumping into these things, not really thinking about the message we're sending. So, so a comment, I'm gonna pick on this one because it's like 20 years old and a lot of people don't have this on their wall anymore. But a common piece of art that you would see on people's walls, we have a picture, says live, laugh, love. You guys are already laughing, so you're setting me up here for this. Um, there's nothing wrong with being alive. There's nothing wrong with laughing. And um, there's nothing wrong with loving. But what does that mean? And... We wanna define these things as Christians. And if that's all you have is catchphrases like that and I am enough and all these things and we're not actually emphasizing God and living for God, we might be really actually emphasizing, hey, be alive, laugh a lot and love some people, whatever that means. And I do think we have a generation, my generation below, that that's the goal. And we've redefined love and we've redefined living. I, I, I'm not saying you have to take that down, but I'm just saying that, you know, you do have to have an emphasis on scripture. Now, the next one I'll say, I do think you should take down. And it's like this, in a lot of children's rooms, all you need is faith, trust, and a little pixie dust. You don't need pixie dust. <laughs> and I think that we, by having things like this up on our walls and on our coffee mugs and all these things, we are emphasizing this to our children that it's a little bit of magic and a little bit of Jesus. What we need to do is we need to be emphasizing the scriptures. But again, we can go wrong there. I've shared this with this church before, but um, Psalm 46, verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. I think we have art for that. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. What a great verse. Be still. And you can be still because you know that he's God. And he's going to be exalted. So there's a peace that comes from that, right? And people would have that on their wall, but it's like, man, that doesn't look all that trendy. So you went ahead there way too fast, whoever. Yeah, thank you. So we back up, and people go back and say, be still and know. Be still and know what? That leaves room for be and still and know whatever it is that's in your heart, whatever it's in your mind. Not, not even that I'm God, not that he will be exalted among the nations. And then again, now you guys can go ahead. Some people have just said, well, be still which is very hard for me to do, but okay, and what? And now we've gone all trendy because you know you gotta be even smaller and just say, go ahead, B. <laughs> I'm telling you that you might not think these things are a big deal, but they are. It's not what you teach, it's what you emphasize that sticks. And we as a church too, like, it's what we emphasize that sticks. That's why I said numbers don't start a conversation, they end a conversation. It's not about that. It's about what the people of God are doing and celebrating the work of the gospel in our lives. Let me just say this to you. When you pick up your children from children's ministry, don't say, did you have fun today? Say, hey, what'd you learn today? It's, I hope they have fun. But ultimately, what did you learn today? How was it? What, that's what we need to emphasize. Okay, I need to keep going because I've only gotten to point one of three and we're running out of time. Okay, number two, second thing we need to embrace, we need to be, if we want to reach the next generation, is to be relational. I'm gonna read Deuteronomy chapter six, verse 20 through 25. It says, when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. 
And the Lord showed us signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. So in verse 20, it tells us about this time when your son is gonna say, hey, why do we live the way we live? Why do we go to church every week? Why do we do the things we do as a family? Why did the pastor say he doesn't like Tinkerbell? Why did my life group teacher say what they said today? Hey, I heard this at school. Why are my friend's parents this way? And and I'll, I'll tell you, it's often not a question and it's just like a statement to see if you're listening to get you to react. And it's usually at a bad time, just so you know, when you're doing seven other things, you know, you're putting kids to bed and washing dishes and trying to not let the house catch on fire and true life situation, one of your children comes up and says, hey, I was just wondering, how can I believe in God if I don't feel him? And you're like, whoa, time out. That's a serious question. Could you just stay right here while I get this out of the oven or whatever it may be? And so this happens, as I referenced last week, by being intentional and having proximity. Intentionality with proximity. Always trying to spend as much time as you can and be intentional about conversations you have. And, and as a church, like this is the vision we have for our groups. And, and some of our groups that have called themselves Sunday school classes for a long time, they've been doing this. But some, you come, you hear a Bible study, you don't see those people again. And the reality is there needs to be the opportunity to have relationships formed where we can ask the questions that we have. It is okay if you have questions about the scripture. In fact, somebody came to me and said, hey, I've been reading the Bible for the first time in my life and I'm learning so much, but also I have a lot of questions about God. And they said, who do I talk to? And I said, me, let's meet, let's talk about that. Because I wanna help you in that. And that should be our desire with our children and the people we do church with is to really focusing on that. We're not swinging the other way where we sit around in a circle and we just say, well, what do you think this means? Like, it doesn't really matter what we think this means. It matters what God thinks it means. So if we're asking what we think it means, it's just so we can correct (laughs) what it actually means. And, you know, we don't just have groups that, you know, we're just gonna hang out, but we're not gonna get into the word. Like, I'm not saying there isn't that aspect of it, but ultimately it needs fellowship is centered around Christ. And so it's this intentionality with proximity. It's this relationship that is built for these moments. Let me just say three things about being relational. First, this is a quote from Reggie Joyner. Moses is warning about the danger of a generation losing their faith. If you want to pass on a legacy to the next generation, it has to be transferred relationally. When we were, Christy and I were 25 to 35, we planted a church and um, saw that church grow and we had a bunch of kids during that time and um, we had this couple in our church who was 20 years ahead of us in life and we just were like sponges soaking up what they had to, taught us and, to teach us. And one of the things they taught us is maintaining a relationship with your children, parenting in a way that they will talk to you. And that's something I try to tell my kids all the time. You can talk to me about anything. I don't know if they do, but I want them to know that door is open. And something else that I've really come to embrace as a parent and as a leader in the church is James says that if any of us lack wisdom, we should ask of God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And so I think when someone's coming to us asking for advice, they're admitting their weakness. We don't need to point out all their flaws. I'm not saying there isn't correction, but I think it should be less of a condemnation and more of a pointing to what the word of God says for them and their life. You don't have to fix everything for everybody. You just have to help them listen to the word of God. And that's the reason they're coming to you is to try to discern God's voice. Okay, B, people need relationships that emphasize the Lord's grace and power and the blessings that come from obeying him. So it's not just friendship that's arbitrary. The, the scripture here says, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. The Lord showed signs and wonders. The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as we are today, this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. I realize this is thousand year, or hundreds of years before Christ, but we see the parallels here. Jesus has saved us and delivered us from sin. 
And, and there's blessings that come from obeying his word. That needs to be part of our aim with our children. C, the greatest opportunity for children, and I've said this three times now, to adopt the beliefs of the church is through the example and encouragement of their parents in discipleship. The primary goal we should have for children's ministry is parents being equipped to disciple their own children. That's the primary goal. Not the church staff doing it for you, but all of us taking ownership of the privilege God has given us in teaching our children to know who God is. The last thing I'll say that we need if we wanna reach the next generation is we need to be intergenerational. We need to be intergenerational. The context of Deuteronomy 6 is the collective society of the people of God as they prepare to enter the promised land. And as we will see next week, the New Testament church is a picture of older generations teaching younger generations. And here's what they teach them. Verse 13 in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve. And by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are around you, for the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from the, off the face of the earth. There is a need to show the next generation who God is in the midst of all kinds of other gods in culture. Exodus 15, 11 says, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Constantly, at least today, there is a rising deistic approach. That's a view of God being a creator who is not involved in our life. And it's even in a lot of people's professing Christianity where they kind of live their life as these practical atheists without really seeing God intervene in their life. That is not who God is. There's, a, there's, a, there's this adoption of new age philosophy that's kind of crept in the church and it's become the filter through which we read the scriptures. You see this popularized in churches like Bethel Church today, but it's, it's been around for 20, 30 years. There's just a softening of who God is because we think it more, makes it more palatable to people. But yet we see here, the scripture says, fear God, recognize who he is, his power, serve him, make him your master, swear by him, I mean, trust him, trust in him and his ways and not your heart because he's jealous for you. And God does judge. God is a God of judgment who we will stand before one day. But in his jealousy for us is the clear pursuit of us in his son, Jesus Christ. And we need to ensure that who God is is actually represented and taught to the next generation. And if we are not doing that and taking ownership of the next generation, we cannot assume that they will grasp the gospel. Whenever Ronald Reagan was being sworn in as governor of California, he said something that I know is familiar to a lot of you. He said, perhaps you and I have lived too long with this miracle to properly be appreciative. He says, freedom is a fragile thing and it's never more than one generation away from extinction. Is that ours by way of inheritance? It must be fought for and defended constantly by each generation. For it comes only once to a people and those in world history who have known freedom and then lost it have never known it again. And what I would suggest is that freedom is somewhat inherited, but it will be lost quickly if we don't focus on it the way we should in that generation. And the ways of God are inherited from us and the blessings of God are often inherited. But if we take our eyes off of that and teaching it to the next generation, it will quickly be lost. And, and, and listen to me, it's not telling them how our generation did it better. There is a responsibility for every generation to direct the next generation, not to our greatness, but to the greatness of God. God has designed this to happen through an intentional Relational, intergenerational church. I'm gonna say that again. There is a responsibility for every generation to direct the next generation, not to our greatness, 
but to the greatness of God. God has designed this to happen through an intentional, relational, intergenerational church. It's not, I had to tell the first service, some of you are more concerned with people singing the hymn, standing on the promises of God, than you are actually about whether or not they stand on the promises of God. And some of you, your kids do not know who DC Talk and Michael W. Smith and whoever else, I didn't grow up in that time frame in church, are, they think it's lame, they're always gonna think it's lame, you sound lame trying to get them to like the things you liked. But the greatness of our God transcends generations. Help them to see his greatness. And that in his greatness, there's a clear display of his grace through Jesus Christ. So here, here's our goals as a church. I'm just gonna share these very quickly. Things we're gonna do to try and ensure this is happening. We're going to emphasize engaging in the discipleship essentials of worship, grow, serve, give, reach. So every believer, we are asking you to do that if you're a member of our church. Being intergenerational is much more than that. But if we are not building that core of discipleship as people who worship, grow, serve, give, and reach, then, then what we might reproduce is not the right thing. So each of us should be disciples of Jesus first. Then we wanna have all of our ministry leadership teams and ministry teams be intergenerational. So that's already been happening some of this church, but we wanna ensure every team that is in leadership, all generations are represented in those leadership, the, those leadership teams. We wanna have events, fellowship events, prayer events that are intergenerational. When we do an event, we wanna think about every generation being a part of it. We want men's and women's ministries with an intentional focus on being intergenerational. So men's and women's ministries that are, one of the primary goals is how do we connect the generations here? In all of our life groups with an average age under 50, we'd like to have a mentor couple. So somebody, I wouldn't say that everybody under 50 is all that young, honestly, but um, you know, 40 and 50 age range, but still people who've kind of reached that next life stage who can pour into and help care for those who are young adults in our life groups. We want our life groups, as much as they can, to engage in church-wide activities for intergenerational connection. So you might primarily be with people your age. Some groups are not that. But when we have the fall festival, even though that's designed towards kids, let's participate in engaging with those young families. When we have you know, our prayer nights, those are a great opportunity to interact with the generations. Whatever it might be that we would say, hey, we're going to do these things so that we can connect with people beyond our narrow scope within the church. We've asked our senior adults to adopt every senior in high school for a two to five year prayer partnership. And so when they're a senior in high school, a senior adult is adopting them and committing to pray for them the next few years of their life. And then finally, we're creating an intentional mentorship program where older generations are mentoring future leaders or active leaders to help reproduce themselves. Our way of doing this is not the way, but it's better than no way. And our hope is that our way and everything that we do will point to the way, Jesus Christ. And let me say to you today, if you're here, and as we're talking about this, which is bigger than you, you realize my life has been so focused on me. God invites you to be a part of the story of his glory. And he's given you the opportunity to do that, even though you've rejected or run from him to the person of Christ. And that's really what we want all this to point to. And as I was thinking about how to close this morning and trying to think of some good story, I thought about it yesterday. I said, I think our church is a great, beautiful picture of this. I mean, you go back to 1910 when, when people came from Fudiac Springs to plant our church because they saw a need for this area, for the gospel to be planted here. And so then you've seen people, I mean, who will never even know their names, some of us, who poured blood, sweat, tears, money, time into this church to see the gospel go forth. And then I think of recent history. 15 to 20 years ago, a group of people from this church realized we have to focus on reaching the next generation. We want them to grasp the gospel. We do not want there to be a generation that rises after this that does not know the Lord or his work. And, and, and God has used those men and women to bring us where we are today. I realize a lot of you in this service, you are newer than me to this church. I've only been here five years. And the Lord had a vision that was communicated by our former pastor and others that brought us to where we are today. And that's the kind of 
mindset that we should have, we're investing to see that legacy of the gospel continue. And as we talk about what we're trying to do as a church and how I hope we capture this, I can think of no one better than our former pastor, Mike Mugu, to pray. Mike, if you would come here. And he does not like the glory and attention. But I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness and what the Lord has done through you and our church. And I love you and I would not be here and having the opportunity to experience the fruitfulness of God's church without what you've done and others have done. And I just would love you to lead us in a time of response and prayer. Thanks, Mike. Um, Before I lead us in a prayer, I'd like to know if you have come into the church in the last four years, if you could just raise your hand. Boy, look around this. This is amazing. Amen. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Pastor James has has been helping us to see the need and the vision for intergenerational discipleship. And um, back in 2010, we had um, a a desire and a vision to become multi-generational. At that time in our church's history, the majority of the people in our church at that time look like me. <laughs> we were older. <laughs> and, um, and, and many of us began to pray, even our senior adults, Lord, uh, help us see the need for reaching younger people, younger families with children. And we did a lot of different things in order for that to sort of begin to happen. One of the things is there were pews in here at that time. And on one Sunday... We ripped out the pews, ripped them out. And there were some people, ooh, ooh, taking the pews away, you know. Um, I mean, even I as pastor, I had a sort of an attachment to pews, you know. And there were other things that, that we did. But realizing that was just the beginning, just the beginning. And to be able to see what God is doing uh, in the answer to those prayers back in those days is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Now, intergenerational discipleship is so very important. And I know Justin's trying to speed me up here. (laughs) When my family joined this church back in the middle 1960s, I was 15 years old. My sister was about half that age. And um, when I got to be a senior in high school, at Niceville High School, um, there was one other fella and me that came to that class. It was called Sunday School back in those days. David Robinson was his name. We were good buddies. Our teacher was Mr. Jesse Brown. He was well into his 50s and here we were 17, 18 years old and he taught us two boys as if we were a class of a hundred he gave us everything he had just for us two boys and and I've stopped and thought about that so much of, of the importance of passing on investing in the lives of others from one generation to the next. I'll never forget Mr. Jesse Brown. Every Sunday, being prepared, loving us, and helping us, and passing along his his wisdom. And so, as we venture out into this intergenerational discipleship, I hope that you see the value of it. We need each other. We need our older folks, we need our younger folks, and all in between. And this is what this is about. I'm so glad you're a part of it, and I'm glad the Lord has allowed me to stay around and see it happen. And God bless you, and may we bless God. Join me as we pray. Father, you are doing something wonderful in our midst. Help us to see it. 
and not just take it for granted that you are doing something special. Lord, I thank you for Pastor James and for Justin and all of our leadership that you've brought to us at this time. And our ministry and our church and the way you have orchestrated people and generations. Lord, I really believe you have us on the cusp of something really, really great. May we venture forth with you. May we trust you. May we glorify you. May we love you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.